Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Hello and welcome back to the Low Carb MD Podcast. Tro, we've done it again. This is a topic that is so important that, that there's so much confusion about. So we brought on an expert rather than us two rookies. Tro, how are you doing, man? Good to see you. I'm doing great. I'm excited. Uh, today we're bringing a literally a world-class expert on cardiac imaging. Uh, his name is Dr. Ryan Daly. Uh, an extensive and amazing career starting at uh, Boston University uh, doing for medical school, doing his... Um, internship and residency in internal medicine at Boston Medical Center, going to the Cleveland Clinic for cardiology, and then doing another two years in non-invasive uh, cardiac imaging. And, uh, and a nice guy, a certainly low-carb friendly guy, and he's going to educate us about cardiac imaging, the role of calcium scores and what we should know, and the role of you know, other uh, potential imaging modalities. So I'm excited. You know, I'm ready to learn. I got my notepad right here and I got my notes ready. So very, very happy to have you on. And uh, and he's got a cool event coming up, uh, kind of <laughs> nutritionally crossing the aisle with uh, with our friend, Daniel Bellardo, Dr. Daniel Bellardo, another cardiologist. So that's that's cool. I'll let him talk about that a little bit too. Absolutely. Thank you for coming. Hey, it's happy to be here. Uh, very humble to be here. And, and thank you for the very kind words. Um, uh, and uh, this should be a lot of fun. I, uh, talking about cardiovascular imaging is definitely near and dear to my heart. Well, tell us some of the history of this. How did it come out? Because I know a lot of the cardiologists initially were not real keen on the, the coronary calcium scores and, and maybe would, thought it might cut into business and things like that, you know, kind of stay out of our lane type stuff. What, so what's the evolution? How did we start looking at this and how do we get to where we are now? Oh, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, so uh, Arthur Agustin um, actually is one of the, uh, the well, creator of the calcium score, um, known from the South Beach diet. Um, some of the listeners might know, know him from that as well. And uh, so calcium scoring has been around for, for decades. Uh, and it took some time for us to really uh, understand how powerful a tool it is. And uh, the cardiology community, I think, has been slow to warm, and specifically a lot of the guideline committees, it's still not covered by insurance in many states, I think with the exception of Texas. Um, and it was seen as being investigational. Um, and uh, the SECT is, is working on that because it, it really is the most powerful tool we have prognostically uh, to gauge what your relative risk is of having a cardiovascular event in the future. Uh, there's, there's nothing better that tells you, hey, I am at risk of a heart attack than showing you the disease in the heart. Um, so there's some nuance with that. Now, I, there were some people who I think had their own angles on this as it came, um, came forward. Um, and some people have been more slow to warm regarding it. Um, I am definitely a calcium score advocate. Um, so I'm just gonna put that out there. I actually run a calcium score lab here um, at my hospital. Um, and we do probably about 2000 calcium scores per year. Um, so I'm just gonna let that out as a disclosure. Um, but what I see it do uh, as far as adding value to medical decision making is powerful. And, and that's really what calcium score is. It's a shared decision making tool. Initially, it was rolled out as a screening tool. And it was, you know, do you have plaque? Do you not have plaque? And, you know, the, the cost effectiveness of that was really unclear. And some people were getting it who shouldn't be. And there was a lot of different things with that. But the uh, current is here who, I really see as, as one of the central figures in calcium scoring has really um, 
said that we should really look at this more as a decision aid. And when we take patients that we calculate their um, 10 year risk with the um, ACC cardiovascular risk calculator, we take in their blood pressure, we take in their um, cholesterol, we take in their smoking status, we take in their sugar status, and we can get down into that whole sugar status thing. I know Tro has some opinions about that, and I, I have some opinions about that as well. Um, uh, what it doesn't take into consideration is family history, um, which could be problematic. Um, and that's definitely an area where the ACC differs from the SECT. Um, SECT is Society of Cardiovascular CT. So uh, obviously they want to spread the word about um, how CT uh, can improve patient care. So we have to take, you know, if we're truly being scientists about this, we're truly being objective about this, we have to take a look at every, every uh, person's and institutional's uh, invested interests or biases. So, you know, we can have a pretty objective discussion about this. Um, so I'm trying to think of where I was going with this. So basically, uh, once you get a calcium score, you are able to say, hey, listen, this is what I think your risk is. And, and when the this, this higher the score is, the higher your risk is of having an event. That's basically what it translates to. And if you have zero, they call it the power of zero, uh, your risk of having a cardiovascular event over the next five years tends to be low. It's non-zero. Um, and so, I mean, if you are a 45-year-old diabetic smoker and dad had a heart attack at 52, that doesn't mean that you can keep on smoking and eating your Snickers and smoking your Marlboros. Okay, just because you have a calcium score, oh, I'm fine. Um, it's vaping now. Yeah, it's vaping, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, you, you can't keep on doing that lifestyle because calcification does take time. And that is, I think, uh, before we started taping, that's something that, you know, Tro and I were, we were briefly talking about. In younger people, um, a low calcium score can be maybe falsely reassuring. Um, the older you get, the more reassuring it is. Uh, there are certain ethnicities that take a little bit uh, more time um, to develop calcifications. It's not as predictive in uh, the African-American cohort um, per se. Um, so teasing that out is a little hard. My general approach to it is you plug people into the risk calculator um, and you get their 10-year score. And is it 5% or is it 20%? And if it's somewhere between that 5 to 20%, specifically 5 to 15%, that's your sweet spot, okay? Or 7.5 to 15, 15%. And that's, so that's 15% um, or 20% over 10 years is 2% per year, right? That's a 2% risk of heart attack or cardiovascular event per year over the next X amount of years. And that's really where the inflection point is as far as this is somebody who has um, the same risk profile as somebody who has established coronary artery disease. So if you look at somebody who's had cabbage or stents or previous heart attacks, and we look at this cohort, their risk profile tends to be about a risk of 2.6 to 4% per year. Some people higher, okay, um, depending upon where their A1C is and are they doing three packs per day and are they smoking crack cocaine and, you know, all the things that, you know, people choose to do. So when we really drill it down um, and we start looking at uh, their risk profile, we can say, are you somebody who's going to benefit from pharmacotherapy? Um, are you somebody who's going to benefit from the addition of a statin medicine? Are you somebody who's going to benefit from the addition of antiplatelet therapy? Antiplatelet therapy being aspirin or Plavix or something like that. The higher your score is, the more plaque you have. The more plaque you have, the way my mind works, is the higher your risk is of having a cardiovascular event. The risk of having a heart attack at a calcium score of 100 is less than having a heart attack at a calcium score of 300, which is uh, less than having a, a, a risk of 
a, a calcium score of, you know, 2000. Okay. In fact, the 10 year mortality for somebody who has uh, a calcium score of 1700 is 17. Don't quote me on the number specifically, but it's like 17% mortality. I mean, you know, you have calcium score of a thousand, that, that's a bad place to be. I mean, these are people we want to just pound with prevention. These are people that we have to say, hey, listen, you know, kindly, but say, if we keep on going down the road, that's a train and that train's going to hit us, you know? Yeah, I, I there's two things that I, I want to talk to you about and everything you're saying is, is so important and valuable. Um, you mentioned uh, the study, the Power of Zero study, mm -hmm. uh, which kind of took, uh, I think it was a 12-year study. It took um, uh, calcium scores and stratified them of a zero score, uh, one to 100, I think 100 to 400, and then 400 and above. And, and, and it, I think it stratified based on, uh, it measured cardiac outcomes and whether statins had an effect or not over those 12 years. Mm -hmm. And I think it pretty definitively showed that if zero score, there was no real difference in outcomes, whether they took a statin or not. And certainly at a higher score, there was, there was a pretty uh, substantial difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe like a 10% difference in absolute risk of cardiac events. Um, now, I want to... I want to kind of segue that into an older study, the St. Francis Heart Study, mm -hmm. which also took people with a very, very high uh, calcium score. And I think they randomized them to aspirin and a statin. I'm not, sh I'm not sure. Maybe that was a, a retrospective. Definitely, there's definitely, uh, they showed the effect of statin on these patients, yeah. Yeah, so they, they took aspirin and a statin and it approached a mortality reduction. I think the the... You know, so they, they literally took the people with high and low calcium scores, I, I think, I, gotta, I have to remember, and they, did they randomize them to aspirin and statin? And, and I think they showed a, a pretty low number needed to treat to prevent one heart attack. I mean, can you help me understand the implications of using um, a calcium score to guide pharmacotherapy? Um, yeah, ha happily. So... Uh, Kerem this year, if you have an opportunity to um, review some of his presentations, he's, he's very, very profligate um, uh, talking about uh, how we should use this and, and what, its, what its role is in guard, guard, guiding pharmacotherapy. And you're exactly right it, that people who have a calcium score of zero, the number needed to treat um, uh, is is not insignificant. It's if you have a calcium score of zero, the number needed to treat obviously depends upon where you're starting. You know, again, um, I'm going to feel less comfortable um, avoiding a if you have a, a very very high, um, uh, you know, uh, apoB concentration. You know, and you're a diabetic smoker with a family history of, you know premature CAD and, you know, you like to party on the weekends with cocaine. I, you know, this, this, is, this is somebody, I'm going to say, I don't care what your calcium score is. I, I, I want to help prevent your, uh, your risk because if you plug them into the 10-year risk calculator, they're going to be a 20, right. okay? This, this isn't, this isn't a, this, we can de-risk certain people, okay? And when you get a zero, more often than not, that's actually really beneficial. And there's some really great data out there that if you have a calcium score of zero, and this is where I really like it, that if you have a calcium score of zero, the likelihood of you getting benefit in terms of primary prevention using aspirin is very low. And, and, and dare I say, there is actually a line um, of harm that the number, you know, there's a number needed to harm when you give aspirin. And that's, I think it's one out of 300, might be one out of 250. Um, it's not super high, but there's gonna be somebody who's got a peptic ulcer disease or GI bleed or something like that, even from 81 milligrams of aspirin. So where the inflection point is with antiplatelet therapy, there was a nice paper in Circ Outcomes. Um, I forget who wrote it but it's a circa outcomes paper. And basically it showed that uh, 
uh, 100 for a calcium score is where you start to see the separation of the curves as far as benefit from antiplatelet. So if I have a patient who's got a calcium score of zero of, of 100 and they say, should I take a aspirin a day? And I would say, yeah, probably. You're yeah. probably going to get benefit. Now everything's individualized, right? So, you know, if they have a history of alcoholism and, you know, recurrent GI bleeds, then we got to weigh the risk benefit of that. Um, but, you know, for most people who have a calcium score of 100, that's a CAD risk equivalent. They should be on aspirin, okay? Because there's a lot of confusion in the lay, in, in, well, in the lay persons about where we should be using aspirin. And calcium score almost helps us be more pre precision guided. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but. Um, Are you kidding me? You're talking to the guy who cursed on Twitter. Yeah. And you're like yeah. wondering about precision guided. Yeah. So. <laughs> no, so, it is precision guided. Yeah. yeah absolutely. So, so, but I, I think that that helps you be a little bit uh, more uh, accurate about who's going to get benefit, how, how, we, can, how we can maximize benefit um, as far as reducing events and somebody who um, uh, is probably not going to get benefit. If you have the 65-year-old woman who's got a calcium score of four, okay, and has got an a, you know, ASCVD risk score of 7%, I'm really not going to push aspirin on her. I'm, I'm just not. I'm not, that's, that's not where I'm, I'm you know, really going to push it. If somebody has horrifically debilitating myalgias and myositis and has a calcium score of 12, are they going to get a lot of benefit? This is where we do shared decision making, right? And we right. say, this is what your relative risk reduction is. This is what your absolute risk reduction is. This is what the number needed to treat is. And you try to explain these things. And, and then the, you and the patient make that decision. But if they have a calcium score that's greater than 100, the number needed to treat is like somewhere between one out of 35 and one out of 42. I've got the number on my phone. That's usually what I do when I pull it up. But if you, if, if you, if you have a calcium score of 100, more, many patients will benefit from statin therapy. So um, can I, can I, I'm going to, I'm going to come in right here because I want to do a little translation and maybe Brian, you can help me because right now as an internist, I'm like sitting here, like this is, you know, we're sitting in amongst somebody who's really talking about complex things, even for a, for a, for an internist. So let's make it, let's bring it down to the, to the listener level here. And, and, you know, basically we're talking about a CAT scan of the heart. Okay, and you have a CAT scan of the heart and you want to know when we want to use this tool to help patients decide if they will benefit from a medication or not. And if there's a lot of calcium in the heart, we're thinking that that may mean disease. And so we'll then be more inclined to think about using aspirin, which is a blood thinner, right? Or will uh, a statin medication, okay? But ultimately this comes down to talking with the patient and seeing what their individual kind of history is. If, if you know, Dr. Daly right now just mentioned uh, myositis and myalgias, if somebody took a statin and they have, uh, you know, muscle aches and brain fog and, you know, telling them to, to take the, a medication that, that makes them feel miserable probably is not an ideal long-term strategy, right? So you may want to look at another medication or, or at least emphasize lifestyle a little bit more. And that's what we're talking about here, using this tool of a CAT scan to help guide a patient and guide the, the, the physician, like what is the risk of something really bad happening? And uh, uh, I think it's an amazing tool. We use it very frequently. I want to say, I mean, we're probably one-tenth the volume. We, we got to order about 200 calcium scores a year here. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say, Brian, what, what's your... What's your thoughts? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing the same. And I would love to hear, Dr. Daly, uh, is there a certain, um, like, MESA, any, any uh, algorithm that you think is most beneficial for when we get a coronary calcium? I love, 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 love the MESA coronary artery um, calcium score risk calculator. Um, and you can Google it. And That's what I is, use. This is what I do. And I plug in all the risk profiles, and I get the calcium score. And then basically that re-risk stratifies them. So basically you, you see what they were before the calcium score and after the calcium score. And then you can start having some conversations, okay? Because if they're like, well, I just have some blood pressure and, you know, and, and you're looking at this guy, right? And they have central obesity and they have triglycerides to HDL ratio of like 50, right? 
and dad had a heart attack at, you know, 52. And you're going, I know you just have blood pressure. <laughs> I know, but let's get that calcium score. And if they have a calcium score that's through the roof, right? You know, if they have it, uh, or, or and, and, and not just the number, right? So this takes time. And this is another thing that's a little bit more um, second level understanding. It's also the percentile. Yeah. So if you are, you know, when, how much plaque do you have compared to your peers? Because if you're 42 and you have a calcium score of 50, that's probably going to put you in the 75th or 80th percentile. Yeah. Okay. You shouldn't have one, right? And especially if you're a woman, my God, if you have a calcium score of 50 and you're a woman, you know, that probably puts you, you know, in the, you know, I, I, I don't want to make up numbers, but. It's, it's a high percentile. Yep. It's a high percentile. And, and that's another area where you're saying, well, listen, we already have accelerated atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis obviously is the process of forming plaque in your heart. And what can we do to retard um, uh, this progression and, uh, or stabilize the plaque? Because some people, uh, you, know, you know, we had talked about this and I think that I think that we should talk a little bit more about it is that um, we've noticed that putting patients on statins raises calcium scores, right? Yes. That's a conundrum right there, right? Isn't that a conundrum? Okay. Yeah, and yeah, exercise, and exercise too, right? I've seen and, literature and, showing and, that. And exercise does. So, but, but let's, let's, let's dig deeper in this, right? So, so their calcium score goes up but their mortality goes down. Okay, so would you rather have a high, higher calcium score or a lower mortality? Exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, that's, and that's the point is in medicine, we become so focused on numbers that we get messed up. For instance, my biggest dilemma is a 34 year old triathlete who's working out like crazy, mm -hmm. six pack abs, mm -hmm. LDL cholesterol comes in at 480. Mm. Right. It was a hundred before he started getting so fit. Now he's like, he, he's working out hard. And this is actually a, a person I recently saw. We liberalized his carbs. Now his, his, he dropped his LDL like 200 points. But the problem is when you start looking at this stuff, uh, in, in the numbers at the numbers, you think, uh Oh, this guy's young. But then my coronary calcium score, like, what do you do with the 34 year old, 36 year old with really high LDL cholesterol? It's kind of a tough, um, yeah, the calcium score may not help. Right. Yeah, it may not help because they're young enough, but you look at it, it to be zero. And he's not a guy who's sitting and smoking and drinking and all that kind of stuff. So, it, you know, we run into this, that conundrum. And also you have the person who's been on a statin drug for the last 30 years, uh, you know, and then they're, they have no risk factors. And you're like, well, is it helpful or not? And now I'm, his coronary calcium is going to be high. So I don't even it's, it's probably not even helpful to look at that point. Not helpful to look at that point in what? At the coronary calcium score, because they're going to get a falsely elevated coronary calcium if they've been on a statin for a long time. Yeah, I see, I see that a lot. You know, like a preventative cardiologist started somebody on a cat and they have no risk factor. Like if the, you take the coronary calcium out, you know, there's somebody who was a worried well person, did as they're told, and now they're 65 and they've been on a statin for 30 years or 20 years and their coronary calcium comes back at like, you know, a 50th percentile. And they're like, can I come off this medication? And I've run into that. Like, you know, I, I'm like, I don't know. Let me call up Ryan Daly. <laughs> you know, like, so, so let's, you know, I, I, this is a really great opportunity for us to have this discussion. And let's, we're going to get in the weeds on this one. Okay. So the, the way that I would, again, everything is through the lens of shared decision making. Right. And we have to, we're, we're applying population based um, observation to an individual. And, and that's why we have to do shared decision making. So we take this, you know, what happens if we treat 10,000 people this way? This is what happens. And this is how we get our event rate. So with the MESA risk calculator, once you get that calcium score, then, you know, if they have a calcium score of like 25, right, and you put them in the MESA cal you know, risk calculator, and then they come up with a 10 year risk of, um, you know, 5.6%, okay? Well, that's 5% over 10 years, okay? That's less than 1% per year, right? So you ask the patient, you know, if you take, this is your event rate, if you take it, okay? So if, so 
that's five, you know, 5% over, um, you know, 10 years, you know, is this something that you want to go do, right? Because where we're supposed to have the conversation about whether statin therapy is appropriate for them is 7.5% over 10 years, okay, which is still less than 1% per year. Yeah. And then what we're doing is we're, you know, with statin therapy is reducing that 1% per year by, you know, what, 20%? So you go from 1% to 0.75%? Not much. So is, 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 that, is that, you know, you still get that same relative risk reduction of a very, very small number. Exactly. I, you know, I had a patient recently, we plugged into the Mayo Clinic uh, guidelines, and you're like, okay, look, if you don't do anything with your cholesterol levels and coronary calcium, you have a, like, three out of 100 will have a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Put you on a statin for the next 10 years, two out of hundreds are going to have a heart attack. So you're, if you're that one person, then it's important. Right? But how do you know? We can't predict who's that person, but all we could do is focus on lifestyle and say, okay, look, you but 98% of the time, 99% of the time, we're going to be right. But we're just that 1% of the time and we have to go before the judge. That's where the primary care physicians get concerned, right? Because the biggest focus, and I think stepping back a step, you know, it, we've had enough people, cardiothoracic sur surgeons on, tro, cardiologists, um, and they're saying, look, it's the high insulin, high sugar that's the problem. That's what we're seeing when we're doing bypasses on people. That's what we're seeing. And so then you say, how come this coronary calcium doesn't factor in insulin levels or A1C levels necessarily um, to see coronary calcium progression or regression? And, and so th there's a lot of questions that come up with this saying, okay, if I have a, high, a fairly, say if I have a score of 60, Five years later or 10 years, whenever we recheck it, they don't progress at all. Are they at any increased risk of where they were? No, the, their risk went down, right? Because their percentile went down compared to the population. Right? Exactly. Is that right, Dr. Daly? Or, exactly right. Yeah, you know. but for, for the most part, because they're, if, if, if you, you've demonstrated halting progression, right, yeah. that's, a, that's a good thing. And I, I think that people, let's talk, can, can we talk about, um, statins and increasing calcification for a second. Yeah, yeah, yes, please. So, so I'm sure that there's some cardiologist out there that's smarter than me that can explain the mechanism of this. But we know cal the body only has so many ways of healing itself, and calcification is actually a healing process, right? So if you break a bone, you, you get calcium, and, th and this is the way I think about it in my very simple mind. So calcification is the body trying to heal the injury that happened in the corner, okay? And the denser the calcium, believe it or not, actually the less risk of an event. So right now we're actually thinking that we may not be measuring calcium ideally because it's the less dense calcium that is at higher risk and it's non-calcified plaque, okay? that's even higher risk, okay? So calcification is actually a healing process. So the thought is, at least among the circle that I've, I've been talking about, that when we see the increase of calcification with exercise, that we see the increase in calcification with statin therapy, this is more dense plaque, okay? And this is actually a healing process. So you're taking stuff that you didn't see on the calcium score, okay? It's not that you're getting more plaque, it's just you're calcifying the non-calcified plaque. The, the other stuff that was, you know, you were seeing the calcification are the bear prints and you're scared of the bear, okay? So yeah. if you have a lot of bear prints around your house, it's likely that there's a non-calcified plaque that's the big bear that's gonna get you, okay? So that's, that's why when you have a high calcium score, um, it just means that you have more bear prints so there's more likelihood that you have an unstable or vulnerable plaque somewhere in that vascular bed. So the, the, the calcification with athletes actually tends to be um, more of a scaffolding issue, that this is where they actually have much more positive remodeling, it means the vessel actually gets bigger. So if you have like a triathlete, you know, or a marathon runner, they have like these, you know, uh, horrific calcium scores. This is an area where we're still trying to understand a little bit more because the thought is, is that again, they're having micro injuries and they're actually having your cap, their vessels are getting bigger, but, and they're getting stiffer. Um, and that calcification is healing um, of the coronary artery. 
Now, I don't know if this is a sub-segment that has been studied well. And, you know, people are going to say, well, high calcium score equals high events. Medicine, when you start to, simp you, you know, make things as simple as possible, but not overly simple. Because there's, you have, medicine, when we start to take this unbelievably complex system and overly simplify it, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to understand it. You know, there's always and, nuance. There's always yeah, there's, oh, there's always this 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 nuance, and you know, and you know, and you've had these conversations with people about LDLC, and like you know, and and, and Ivor Cummings, LDLC, uh, LDLC is you know, you know, it's, it's yeah. BS, it's BS, it's BS, right? And that's and and that's what Ivor will, will will say. But then you start drilling it down. Well, perhaps it's the small, dense, you know, uh, damaged LDL. But this is again, the LDLC is 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 the is the bare point right? It's, it's, it's a paw print. And it's just, that's just a marker of other bad cholesterol here. Okay. So it, it's, you know, and I'm probably, uh, I'm not a lipidologist. I'm, I'm just a, I'm a, you know, I'm a preventative cardiologist. I don't pretend to have a, a degree in, in lipidology. So, uh, you know, Dr. Lipid, please don't, you know, send me an email. <laughs> no, no, listen, we have, we have a lot of problems with Dr. Lipid, actually. We've, uh, you know, uh, the Na National Lipid Association, we, you know, we're coming after them specifically about some things that we think they're not evidence-based. So, um, you know, we can all look to improve, right? We all have areas that we need to improve. And I think Dr. Lipid, specifically the NLA, um, you know, with their guidelines against ketogenic diets and severe hypertriglyceridemia, you know, you hit home for me right now. You, you triggered me because I think uh, we have to take the dogma out and we have to appreciate the nuance, right? Just it, um, it's, it's all about dogma, right? I, you know, there's, there's things that we think we know. We're so cocksure that we know. And uh, we, can't, we can't have cancel culture when it comes to medicine, okay? We can't, we can't have it. Um, it's, it's, it's completely inappropriate because you have to be able to speak freely and the truth will speak for itself. You know, show me that I'm wrong. Show me that my hypothesis is wrong. Okay. Wow. That's our, can... that's our outtake, man, for this, for this episode. <laughs> that is so true. I've been seeing that and that is so true, doctor. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> yeah. Every, every, we have to, it's, it's not that you listen to the crackpots right? It's just that th these are doctors. And if we're, if we're saying that, hey, hey, listen, you know, I'm seeing these people who have their LDL is actually increasing, but I think that they're getting better. Okay. You know, their HDL, their LDL went up by 20%, but their HDL went up by 90%. And then all of a sudden these ratios changed. And, and what does this mean? Okay, what does this mean? Is I mean, does does the LDL, the higher LDL C, trump the fact that I completely resolve their uh, hypertriglyceridemia, I improve their insulin sensitivity, I raise their HDL? I mean, is what trumps what? And I, you know, I don't want to be dogmatic about it because I don't know enough, and I want to explore this. You know, yeah. I, 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 it's I. I it comes do. from humility, though. You see that? That's that. It comes from a place of being humble and saying, "I don't know." I think we oftentimes, as doctors, we want to say, "We know, we know, we know," mm. right? And there's a lot of stuff we know. I mean, you know, um, yeah. And I think it's like that when you say, "Do not question the." We say this, and this is the way it is. Instead of saying, "Wait, let me sit back and look and see what I'm seeing," Ivor came out strong on on some some things with uh, you know social distancing and and lockdowns, and. We'll see who's right down the road, but you have to hear those those opposing views and say, okay, is what we're doing is let's assess it and reassess the same thing we're we're talking about with you know low fat diet. Let's reassess and see what the outcome's been. We have a, a an epidemic of obesity and diabetes. These are the most uh, at risk people. I just saw as far, far as countercultures go, a good doctor said, "Gosh, I'm so frustrated. I've intubated so many people with obesity and diabetes," and he got attacked like very attacked on. Twitter, I came to his defense a little bit because people said, well, you're fat shaming people and you're treating people poorly and you're, you have no, he's like, that's what I'm seeing. And he was just being, he was just making an honest observation and he just got lit up by tons of people. I think that, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk about something a little bit controversial. I'm going to try to do so with the utmost sensitivity is that fat shaming is wrong. Okay. Fat yeah. We all agree on that for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and uh, I, 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 there's never a place for that. But I don't think that we should be celebrating obesity either. 
okay? Yes. And I don't want to ever give anybody a negative body image uh, or, neg or, or decrease their, their self-worth. And I don't think that we should judge somebody because they have obesity. But we have to reckon, guys, that it's a disease, okay? That, that this, is, this is somebody who is metabolically unhealthy. And that's going to lead to health consequences. So this is, this is, you know, go see Tro, let him help you. You know, go see somebody who's going to help you increase your uh, lean body mass. Because we know that obesity, you know, every seven pounds of obesity increases your risk of heart failure by 11%. It's the seven to 11 rule. Wow. Wow. Every seven pounds of obesity increases your risk of heart failure by 11 yeah, that, that heart has to work right it, heart is. Has to work. it is and and that's one of the things that we see with you know sglt2 inhibitors that you get weight loss right and you get uh and you reduce blood pressure and and what does it do to your ldl uh good cardiologist um, um, um listen I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna i'm not gonna go there <laughs> what, I, what i am gonna say is you know, Tro, why don't you talk about your experience with, I uh, hate to turn the tables with, you know, uh, interviewing here, but <laughs> when, you, when you put somebody on a ketogenic diet or you put somebody on a low carb diet, do they lose weight? Do they lose water weight? Do they do, they, do, they do diuresis? Yes. Do they a lot? Yes. We, we, we posed to uh, Ethan Weiss about three years ago. We were talking about this. Can we get a trial up and running for a ketogenic diet and heart failure? Hmm. Uh, because the mechanisms are all there. The improved cardiac, you know, there, there's some evidence that the let heart me, can utilize it. But let, me, but let me jump in here, Tro. Let me jump yeah. in here. This is a very scientific study. Uh, a guy comes in yesterday, the insurance guy, to look at my sprinkler system in my office. And he goes, low carb, huh? And we, he started talking. He goes, oh, my gosh, saved my mom's life. My mom has lost over 100 pounds. And she's, like, in her 70s, late 70s heart failure, the cardiologist said, maybe you should try a ketogenic diet and see what happens. Her ejection fraction has, and obviously I haven't seen the data, this is his word of mouth, he's just sharing this with me, has gone up 40%, cardiologist is stunned, uh, everyone's stunned, her primary doesn't know what to do, she's off most of her meds, her diuretics are gone, and she's doing better on a ketogenic diet, and she's, she goes, this is the easiest thing I've ever done, and she's feeling great, she's traveling again, she was bed bound before, now she's up and about. We saw the same thing, Christian Assad talking about this with people on hospice, reversing on a ketogenic diet and said, this is going to kill you. And that, that's what's so amazing about it when you see these, these stories and hear these stories from everyday people that are just, their life is better. I, you know, you say, what in the world are we doing? You know, when we start talking about ketogenic diet um, and using saturated fat, there's so much nutritional dogma. There's so much vitriol. There's so much cancel culture that you know, we can use compassionate use for X, Y, Z, but why can't we do compassionate use? Uh, do we have the long-term data regarding ketogenic diets you know, you know, in, in heart you know, for over two years for safety? No, but I, I can tell you that I know what's gonna happen if this person continues to weigh 600 pounds. I know that, right? Yeah. So, and if they can't afford to have bariatric surgery or they are unwilling to have bariatric surgery, should we just let them suffer weighing 500 pounds? Or sh should we compassionately offer them a ketogenic diet? And, and this is a question that I pose to the overall cardiology community, which is not keto friendly at all, right? So AHA, saturated fat's gonna kill you, right? That's, that's, basically, that's basically it. And whenever, uh, you know, I, I, they want you to do calorie counting and they want you to do all these, you know, try true Mediterranean diet. And, you know, again, that's, that's basically dogma. And um, I know that that's the best data that I have, but I have seen personally what a ketogenic diet has done for some of my patients with the 60 pound, with the 100 pound weight loss. And they've kept that off. Right, and you can't tell me that there's not uh, going to be an improvement in blood pressure. There's not going to be an improvement in heart failure. There's not going to be an improvement in sleep apnea, which is going to, you know, there's not going to be an improvement in your AFib. So I improve hypertension, I improve AFib with a hundred pound weight loss. What's that going to do for cardiovascular outcomes? Now, again, surrogate endpoints. You know, always yeah. be wary of surrogate endpoints, right? That's what we're always talking about. 
and I don't have an yeah. I don't have an RCT to randomized control trial to basically say that my observation, you know, the the, the road to hell is paved in biologic plausibility, right? Well, can we, I, saw, we saw this in we saw this with COVID. Yeah. Right. Can I talk? Can I talk a little bit about this? I, I because what you're saying is that, like you know we don't have a RCT, you know we don't have an RCT, and in fact I remember uh, I don't know it was like eight years ago, mm -hmm. Steve Neeson was talking about coronary artery calcium scores, and he said we don't need them, just take a statin. Okay, so he said we don't need them. It costs eight hundred bucks. Meanwhile, it costs a hundred dollars. Right. Okay. And he said, uh, and I respect him. I've attended several of his lectures, watched them. I, I, I respect his opinion. And he said, we don't need them. Just to, a statin costs pennies. Mm -hmm. The sco the the um, the CAT scan costs money. So yeah. just put people on statins. And and you know what about? We talked about statin intolerance at the time. We've talked about myalgias and liver injury and increased insulin resistance and all of the issues related with statins, where maybe you'd want to not be on a statin. Um, or maybe it's diet-induced hyperlipidemia and you know that it'll reverse if you make some modest changes like Brian alluded to, instead of going on a statin. And that calcium score can help provide shared decision-making and, and lower potentially demonstrate lower risk. But then, you know, several years later when the uh, injectables came out, the, the P, uh, uh, SCK, uh, PS. P whatever you know PCSK9. Or path up, yeah. pcsk9 inhibitors came out all of a sudden statins were like oh you know all the 20 percent of people who can't tolerate them should get this and so i find it i find that the dogma is sometimes uh even in the brightest people the most intelligent people you know what is the frame in which they're looking at at these issues you know how can it be that we shouldn't do calcium scores because everybody can tolerate a statin and then you turn around and you know, it's like, hey, look, if you don't tolerate a statin, there's this injectable uh, because it all lowers your LDL. Um, so I've had a hard time reconciling all this and explaining the paradigm, this paradigm to my patients, you know, that the medical literature is not, not without its own issues. So what do you think about that? You know, should we, uh, you know, he's a brilliant guy, you know, Steve Neeson, a researcher. He's been uh, head of major organizations and he says calcium scores are he was my old boss. He was my old chief. I uh, uh, we used to call him Uncle Steve. Um, yeah. So he, uh, I know Dr. Nissen very well. Um, I, I got to tell you that betting against Dr. Nissen is kind of like betting against uh, Vegas. Uh, you're usually going to lose. Yeah. Um, he uh, he is. He has a very unique angle on different things. Um, I got to tell you that here, I disagree with him, and I think that he's wrong. I don't think that I, and, and I do so with a lot of humility because I mean, this is the former president of the American College of Cardiology, former chief of cardiology at the Cleveland Clinic, um, you know, 80 New England Journal of Medicine articles. I, I mean, this is a very, very smart man. So I disagreeing with him, um, I do so with humility, um, understanding that maybe I'm wrong, but I don't see putting in statins in the water as being the right solution. You know, I, one of the things that we never talk about, you know, and, and all of, you know, um, um, you know, being an allopathic doctor is, is when can you take patients off of statins? You know, and, and can we get patients, you know, if you have coronary artery disease or you have peripheral vascular disease or you have diabetes, can you ever get them off of it? You know, even, even I ask this to my vegan friends and our plant and my, my plant-based friends, you know, is there a time where we can no longer, we do this with hypertensives, right? So if your blood pressure improves, you get, you get, you, you know, and I get you to lose 50 pounds, we take you off your ACE inhibitor, right? If your ejection fraction proves and it's, and, and it's above 60%, you know, sometimes we can even get you off of ACE inhibitors or off of, you know, uh, certain other different meds. Is there ever a time to de-escalate therapy from statins? And I don't know the answer to that. I, I pose that as a question to the scientific community. Um, Who would run that trial? It, 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 wouldn't it be fantastic? Because Who would run it? Yeah, we. we well, I, 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 I don't know. You'd have to. It, it, that's the issue, right? So people are making money from being on drugs, and um, I, the federal government would have to run it um, because you'd have to have. A, a, it would have to be a very large multinational trial, and it's so cheap, right? 
So uh, it's, it's the statins are very, very cheap. So it's just easier not to do the trial. So these are the competing interests, you know, and, and, and I, I don't know the answer to this, to this question. Um, uh, you know, if you are, you know, have a waist to hip ratio that's really, really tiny and you get your six pack abs and your HDL is, you know, 80 and your LDL is, you know, 70 and you're not smoking and yada, 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 and you have coronary artery disease, do you still have to be on a statin? Now, I got to tell you that there's going to be about 2% of this, 2% of the population that's actually going to achieve this. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I mean, to, to get to be, uh, to be optimal medical therapy from a lifestyle standpoint in today's day and age is so rare. I mean, the degree of sarcopenia that is lack of muscle mass is just, my God, that's the biggest public health crisis. I mean, you can't get anybody to do 30 push-ups, right? Like how yeah. sad is that? that? That's a huge issue. That's a huge deal. I mean, I, I've seen studies on this, that the more muscle mass, if you're in the top third of muscle mass, Ben Bikikio, a friend of mine uh, who, who's an exercise physiologist and all that, uh, saying, hey, it decreases your risk significantly. Why? The more muscle mass you have, the more insulin sensitive you are. The lower your insulin level is going to be. The, the insulin like growth factors and all these kind of things of, of decreasing. So that's what I mean. You look at it, you step back, you think, what in the world are we doing? We throw someone on a statin drug who's diabetic, their sugars go up, their insulin goes up, and we never talk to them about diet and lifestyle. We just say, here, take this drug. Yeah, that's right. It, it's a problem. Yeah, I, I, I don't think, I think that most preventative cardiologists, I would hope, I would hope, I, I mean, all of us see lifestyle as the cornerstone of therapy. Um, I, you know, and I would talk to you, you know, even my vegan friends or vegetarian friends, I, I mean, you know, uh, even the people that I disagree with, uh, you know, that lifestyle, getting rid of the sugar and the bread and, and, and things like this. And I, you know, I agree with Tro that I don't think that moderation with you know, donuts is, is really the answer. Or you can have, you know, it's, it's there. That's, that's not the, not the secret here, but weight loss lifestyle um, is an, an increasing muscle mass. And I think that car, that even the cardiology community was a little bit remiss because we really pushed cardio, right? So it was cardio, 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 and nobody talked about resistance training. And, you know, there's different types of muscle fibers and I, uh, muscle mass and strength is actually really important. And uh, we've seen this, this waning. And we are, I think we are seeing uh, more uh, preventative uh, experts pushing the resistance training, but not enough. And definitely not at the internist primary care level who are really the tip of the spear with this, that we do need to get our patients stronger. Um, and we need to start early in life. We, I, I mean, we've gotten rid of PE programs across the country, right? You know, it's, it's, we don't have physical ed. We don't have people doing push-ups. We don't have kids running. You know, I remember I used to get sweaty as all hell, um, you know, before lunch and they'd have us out doing laps, you know, and, you know, climbing ropes and things like this. And when's the last time you saw a kid, you know, climb a rope in the gym that wasn't, you just, you just don't do that anymore. And that's the impending disaster we have coming because I see it because most of us weren't obese when we were in high school, except for me and Tro, but everyone else wasn't. But, you know, you look at that and it's the normal now. And then you see where are these guys going to be in 20 years, 30 years? They're, it's going to be an absolute disaster for our healthcare system. That's what Tro and I are looking at and saying, we got to do something about this. Because as an example, I went to get my hair cut the other day because I'm direct primary care. I can get out in the light of day to get my haircut now. Got to rub but, it in, huh? Got to rub yeah, it in yeah. the haircut, but, huh? But the point is, <laughs> the point is I'm looking around my kickboxing gym gone, the gym across the street gone in this center. What's open? Starbucks is open. The ice cream shop's open. The donut shop right next door to my gym is open. Uh, all these things, but my gym is cleared out and gone. Why? Because they can't afford to live right now, right? So I mean, you look at it, it's like, what are our priorities at some point? It's like, who, who's the essential business? Donuts? That's an essential business, but my gym isn't. So, you know, you start looking at the things Peloton like that. Up. I, I'm just saying, you know, there's certain, there's the, the Peloton stock's gone up. More people are doing home exercise, but I agree with you that, that that's where it's going. That, yeah. That, that's, you know, you're, you're completely right though. Uh, I, I mean, as a society, our, we don't have the right priorities um, as far as fitness goes. Um, and, you know, you go to the doctor and it's like, Lip service, right? Eat right, exercise. And, and then who really, 
you know, nobody knows what you write means. I'm going to tell you right now, I have not met one physician, one physician outside of the low carb community. Some in the, some in the, actually the plant-based community get lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Some of them, certainly the paleo community gets lifestyle. Okay. Um, and, and the low carb community, I think really gets lifestyle in terms of lifestyle, got like guiding people to lifestyle. You cannot be hungry and try to lose weight. Mm. It is going to be a, it's going to be like pushing the boulder up the hill. They don't know it. They don't know it. And the conventional doctors, the dietitians, they don't know this. It's really simple. Fix appetite, fix hunger, fix cravings, then fix metabolic health, then fix weight loss. It, you need three months before you can even think about weight loss. You need two months before you can even think about weight loss. It's like meeting somebody, hi, you're beautiful, let's have sex. Like, no, go on a couple of dates. You know, like, uh, it's, it's, I'm sorry, you know, like, it's, yeah. it's, it's doctors jumping the gun. They want the goal, but they don't know how to get patients to there. Right. And I, I, I feel very strongly about it. But I want to ask you more about cardiac imaging. I hope you let me come in. And, Wait, Troy, uh, let me, let me jump yeah. in just real Go quick. Ahead. Go ahead. Doc, what do we look at? Sorry, Troy. I, I like to cut you off every one, every five uh, episodes. Ahead, I want man. to do go it ahead. once. Uh, <laughs> I'm, what I'm curious about is we get someone with an intermediate coronary calcium score, you know, mostly in the LAD or somewhere or something like that. And they say, okay, doc, what do I do? What do we tell that person? If they go, look, I'm not taking a statin. I don't care. So what I know Perlmutter has some data looking at uh, dietary changes and some supplements, anything that you would recommend saying, okay, look, if it's me and my coronary calcium is the middle of the road somewhere and I'm pretty fit and active, my lifestyle is pretty good. Do you have any ideas diet-wise or dietary changes or um, yeah, supplements? K2 and D3, K2, D3, D3 things along those lines. So Aaron Mikos has been pretty, um, uh, has done some really wonderful work. And, and most supplements are basically just expensive urine. I mean, they, they, they basically are. Um, our bodies are very, very powerful at extracting micronutrients. And eating whole foods and not eating anti-nutrients Right, so anti nutrients. I, I there's one guy on Twitter who who basically co you know called uh, like a, a Twinkie like an anti push up, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. and and it's 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 just that. So the more sugar that you consume, the more you're sucking out important nutrients. So I mean, you can get a lot of your uh, um, important nutrients from just basically eating high quality food, eating uh, your fish, eating your um, Brussels sprouts, eating um, uh, tree nuts, eating your, you know, your walnuts, eating your occasional uh, potato, things like this, because this is how we evolved. We're not, we, we didn't evolve to need supplements, right? You know, that's not how we evolved. So something went remiss along the way. You know, we, we, you make a lot of your vitamin D by going, you know, being outside. Um, and, and that's what, people need to do. People need to go outside and, and get a, a, a safe, reasonable amount of sun exposure, whatever that is, according to the dermatologist. But I mean, you're supposed, you're not supposed to be inside all day long. I mean, that's not how we evolved. Um, you know, and, and you should be able to make adequate amounts of vitamin D by actually being a human being who goes out and, and gets some sun and Oh man, you're playing right to his wheelhouse oh, because Brian went walking with his whole, with all his patients. Maybe My patients started. are healthier than Tro's now. We went for a hike yesterday and yeah, it was yeah. a blast, blast, yeah. so much fun. You know, uh, just seeing a doctor, two doctors taking a group of patients out on a hike. I mean, seeing that on social media, like it hit home, man. It yeah. hit home, Brian. It made me like. I'm laying down the gauntlet, Tro. I'm yeah. laying it down, man. Let's compete yeah. on this. Now, Dr. Daly, we're going we're gonna to challenge you. Can you go on a hike with your patients? <laughs> well, I actually, speaking of which, I actually signed up for the Indy 500 Challenge. Um, and uh, so we're trying to do 500 miles um, by the end of the year by walking, hiking, bicycling. Nice. Uh, like Things like that. So that's, uh, that'll be between uh, uh, June and, and December. Um, uh, we do do walk, uh, walk with the doc. Uh, occasionally, I think a hike would be uh, fantastic. I love it. Walk with the doc. I love it. Walk, walk, walk with the doc. Yeah, man. And, uh, awesome. no, we have Brian is putting you to shame here. You I know? know. He's like, Brian, that's a little hike. Come on, man. We're doing 500 miles. Okay. He's got bro. a program. He's got I'm a whole starting program walk with the doc, now. Man. Yeah. But yeah. that, but that just goes to how important this is. 
Yeah, I, I just realized that I think it says a tool chug on my uh, thing, but this is uh... <laughs> yeah. no, a it, it won't show up where it's all on it, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's just one of my partners. Um, you know, I, we have to be leaders and, I, and we have to lead by example. Uh, I, I mean, that's our role. And uh, whenever I do see um, uh, an obese doctor, um, I, I mean, we have to really look at ourselves and like we have to get ourselves healthy. Um, and there's so many reasons that doctors are obese. And again, we're not trying to fat shame anybody. Um, uh, you know, we work a lot of hours and access to food and, and, and things like that. But it, but it really is very important for us to be those role models because, you know, how comfortable are you going to be taking advice from somebody who is not healthy themselves, right? It, it's, it's, just, it's just like, well, if you can't do it, what help do I have? Right. And and I think that being that role model, which is why I think it's so powerful with Tro's story, it's so uh, I, I which I know his story more than I know yours, Brian. Um, but, you know, Tro's story, you know, was an, uh, an overweight doctor that really just transformed his life. And now he looks like Superman. You know? Yeah, but 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 disregarding everything they taught us. So I, I feel such compassion for the doctor mm -hmm. who is obese mm -hmm. because, you know, like. You know, Dr. Daly, I'm going to be honest with you. I wasn't the happiest guy. I'm an outspoken guy. You know, you kind of have a sense of my personality maybe on social media. I've never really been depressed, you know, a day in my life. Mm -hmm. But I was so desperate for answers. I'm like taking a PHQ-9 at 350 pounds, which is the depression screen just for everybody who's listening, like taking it again and again. Maybe I'm depressed eating, coming back zero points, coming back zero points. You know, I'm, I'm plugging my, my – I'm taking like the stress – uh, uh, you know, uh, factors that increase stress again and again, right? Like maybe I'm stress eating, you know, and the reason why I'm, I'm bringing this up, but I'm not, it was always zero. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the reality is, is our profession, they have failed. They are failures. I was trained by bright people. I scored on the 90th percentile of my board exam. You know, I got Everything that they told me to get, I memorized their guidelines and what they had to say wasn't enough. And I was trapped. If I followed their advice, I would have been trapped. And then when you go to the primary literature, it's really all there, like, like a beautiful symphony. So my heart goes out to those doctors mm -hmm. because, um, because they're trapped. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I, and I have a compassion trope because I think you look at it. Like right now, yesterday when we were on a hike, it was fun because everyone had continuous glucose monitors. Like, look, my sugars are going up. Look, look. And everyone's having fun. And you realize, yeah, it goes up during exercise. But guess what else makes it pump up? And it was a universal. Every single person who has a CGM said this. This is the day I was really stressed and my sugars went crazy. And as doctors are under massive stress. I mean, I know I was in my old practice, doc. I don't know if you know, but I 17 years standard primary care. Now I'm doing direct primary care. And I'm telling you, I'm a lot happier. And I know my sugar levels are dropping and everything's looking better. And getting but, sleep and, and all and, and all, yeah. all the things, all, all the things that, that go into that. And 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 like Utro, I you know, I was taught to eat um, a uh, very, very low fat diet, you know, especially as a cardiologist, right? And uh, I looked at, I looked at my diet and, you know, I, would, I probably had 10 grams of fat in my diet. I mean, I really, you know, the only fat I got was like when I would eat salmon, you know, I, I didn't, it was very, very low, but I was eating oatmeal and I was eating bread and I was eating all this stuff. And I'm like, well, oatmeal, everybody says oatmeal is great, right? And, and it'd be oatmeal with the, you know, the, the, the instant oatmeal, yeah. yeah. Like that. And, you know, Brown sugar and cinnamon. Five grams of sugar in there, and then I'd have my, you know, you need your doctor, you need, you know, coffee to run, right? I mean, it's kind of like gasoline and put a couple packets of sugar in there. And, you know, and, and then, you know, before I changed my diet, I, I looked at my carb intake and I was doing 300 grams of carbs a day, you know, and probably 150 of it was uh, um, Added sugar. processed. Yeah. Right. I, I, I mean, it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't that I was basically eating all Brussels sprouts and carrots all day long. You know, it, it's, uh, you know, healthy carbs. Yeah. Um, Agnes Ayton showed nobody, nobody binge, hundred percent of binge eating, hundred percent, hundred percent of mo and most snacking, 80% of snacking mm -hmm. is on Nova four processed foods. Nobody's, nobody's binging on carrots, you know, um, 
So yeah, I, I and and did you lose weight? I'm just curious when you made a transition in your I diet. Over 30 pounds. Um, wow. So it's just I uh, I was doing, uh, you know, and I could and uh, at my when I was doing my when I was my strictest with following uh, a, a paleo lifestyle um, and not having the, uh, you know, I, it's still very hard for me to uh, avoid pizza. Yeah. So, and, yeah, pizza is a tough so one for it's, everyone. It's, it's like the devil. It's just really, <laughs> and, and it's, uh, you know, uh, fat. I, what was his name? The the uh, the Irish guy there. Um, fat Emperor Irish. Uh, no, no, Ivan no, 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 no. The, the other guy, uh, Sean. Um, don't eat for winter guy. What's his oh, name? Oh, Kian, oh, Kian Foley. Kian, Kian Foley. Yeah, yeah, he's great. Great yeah. guy. So, so you know, his his insight about when you know don't put fat with carbs together, and he's yeah. so right. I mean the. It, it's it's those those are the things that are so hard to say no to. I mean, who who? I mean, the willpower to say no to ice cream, the willpower to say no to pizza. Um, I, I, listen, I I, I chocolate cheeseburgers, I, cake, chocolate, cookies, cheese potato burgers, chips, yeah, French fries, French right? Fries. They're all the same. I, I mean, it's all when you add those two things, stuff that's not in nature. Um, the modern the modern food, you can see why we get so. I mean, it's yeah. so yummy. Who doesn't like hogging cheese? Yeah. Um, you know, and it's it's just, and yeah. So I, I again, I fail um, personally, and I, I have had my pizza, and I, I hate to say this on a low, I kind of feel like I'm a confessional in the low carb uh, community, and I, but I recognize that it's it's an addictive. Food. We and have uh, we when have it's being real. It's being real I, too, and go look. We all struggle with certain things, right? Yeah. No, we have no, help. We, we got it. You know, fathead pizza. You know, I don't want. Yeah, to... we could do it. We could fix you know, it. Make... You, you can't. And, and I, pizza. Have, to, have to get 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 into that. And I know that there are, are low carb hacks and and things like yeah. that. And, and again, I'm I'm trying. But yeah, I lost thirty pounds. And, and nice, good for you. By, uh, it was mainly by that probably inspired food. a lot of your patients. Yeah. You know, seeing that, did did any of them comment like, "Hey, doc, you lost"? Oh yeah, yeah. that that was pretty. That was pretty interesting. What was also very interesting is, is my shape of my face went from round and, you know, flattened out. Uh, my heart rate went down about 20 points. Um, wow. My blood pressure went from pre-hypertensive down to like, I, I was shocked at how low, with, this is without exercise, I was shocked at how low the blood pressure change was. Like down to like 110 over 70. Wow. No, like completely, completely normal tensive. How, how long ago was it when you did that, Doc? Two years. So it's not sustainable. You've only done it for two years so far. So in twenty, get back to us. <laughs> so, and can I ask you? Can I ask you a question? Uh, did you ever measure your ketones? Um, I did. I did. did. I, I did use a, a keto. Uh, you know, because I did. I did uh, um, try nutritional ketosis for a little bit of time, and I used the urine dipsticks, and I, I did try that, and I found that. I, I just wasn't doing keto, right? Because I, I had, I, I had some angst about doing like a 80% fat, you know, 10% yeah. protein diet. And I just never did that. So I, I did a no sugar, you know, no, no processed carb, no, yeah. no processed foods, kind of like what you were doing, Tro, it, it is a lot of, you know, sometimes I'd have um, tuna for lunch with some Brussels sprouts with butter. And it was just trying, it was much more of a paleo. And sometimes if I'd go and I'd exercise in the morning, yeah, I'd go into, I, I, I was- I went into ketosis. I, yeah. I went to ketosis. Um, but I, unless you eat that high fat diet, keeping that ketosis is, is sometimes challenging. And or carbs low, or carbs low. That's the other thing. You know, I, I have one, I got one quick question for you and I, I've been holding this in for, for a long time. It's about, uh, it's, it's coming back to cardiac imaging. So please give us some last minute, you know, intelligence. I know we're, we're wrapping up here. Is there any role, you know, for, for a CCTA over a calcium score, like a, car, a coronary CTA, you know, in, in the primary care slash prevention practice? No. When do we got to, when do we got to, no, okay. No, no. no. And, 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 and the reason why, so the indication for a coronary cardiac CTA um, is uh, for symptom evaluation. Um, and it's because, I, you know, the radiation dose is still not nominal. 
um, even though, you know, you can get a calcium score um, usually under one millisiever. And uh, with background radiation annually being about three millisieverts. Just being alive, you probably get three millisieverts over a year. So not all centers have the Lamborghinis of CT scans. So you might do a coronary cardiac CT that's 15 or 16 millisieverts. So that's just really not tenable um, for a prevention strategy. So yeah. now, you know, and, and then second, and secondly, um, you need, at least with current technologies, you need IV contrast um, to get a coronary cardiac CTA. And that, that contrast has some risk, right? Um, so I, right now, uh, we don't do screen uh, CCTAs. Yes, you're going to miss non-calcified plaque uh, with um, a standard calcium score. Um, that's, that's, how you, that's why you have to be a doctor. That's why you have to interpret uh, the calcium score um, in the setting of the patient and the risk factors. And well, that's yeah. why the guidelines only re let you de-risk certain people. There's certain people who are like, no, you can't de-risk them. You have to, you, you can't say, no, you can't have a statin. You know, and these are the smokers and the diabetics, right? These are the, your higher risk people. Um, you know, when you're a smoker, I mean, all, all, all things go out the window. I, I mean, that's just yeah. so bad that, uh, you know, your risk is so high that, uh, you know, I don't know how, you know, you're, we're, throwing, we're throwing the kitchen sink at you as far as risk reduction. Like, take the aspirin, take this aspirin, let, my God, do something if we can't get you to smoke, uh, can't get you to quit smoking, rather. Um, so uh, these are- So the it all comes back to lifestyle again. Whether oh, it's a zero score or a high score or a middle score, yeah. it's lifestyle still, right? It's, no, it's totally lifestyle, absolutely. It's, Full stop. And we're crazy for talking about this. I don't get it. I don't get it. No matter who you are, you benefit from lifestyle. That's the take home message. But doc, one other thing, some people uh, along the coronary calcium score, what's our, our, when would we have a shorter screening window? Like if we get an intermediate score or something like that, is 10 years the, the window still? Or do you say, eh, let's check right this now, guy in. So five, I believe, I hope I'm up to date on this. So if you have a calcium score over a hundred, you're pretty much done. You know, you have plaque um, and you'd benefit from, because we're using this as, 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 as I said, a decision um, for determining whether you benefit from an aspirin or something. So once you've reached 100, basically the preponderance of the evidence would say you would benefit from statin therapy, okay? If you're below 100, then after about five years, okay, whether you're a zero, you're a five or what have you, after about five years, it's reasonable to see has it progressed. Now, I can't tell you in the next two to three years that somebody somewhere won't have said, well, I did serial calcium scores every three years and I found that the rate of progression, you know, dictated that we should be more aggressive in this, in this field. And, and, and screening more frequently um, or following serially with calcium scores may be a viable strategy. I just don't have the data on that. And I, I can only just refer you to what our recommendations are um, from a society or as, as a cardiologist. Um, what about the neck? What about the neck? How do you feel about the, the role of a CIMT to look for softer plaques or arterial inflammation in conjunction or not in conjunction? So I'm, I'm a big proponent of point of care ultrasound because we can, we can start to, I know it's not as accurate as calcium score, so I'll admit that. It just, it just uh, performs better. Calcium score performs better. It, 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 it risk stratifies more accurately than CIMT. It's just, yeah. it's just a better test. Now, if you get a calcium score of zero in the heart and you see a Goomba in the neck, well, yep. yeah, I mean, so you're, you're good. You, you have to use your brain on this. And if you own a point of care ultrasound, okay, and you are trained in its use and you have the time to go do that, yeah, you, could, you may be able to get added a value, but do we have the data to say, well, we should be doing this in all patients, right? So like, I'm not going to tell you, no, you're a bad doctor or that's just a stupid idea, but yeah. you know, nor can I, but nor can I, you know, say that all doctors should be doing this um, on all their patients. You know, if you say, listen, I like to do this as part of my comprehensive exam. I feel that this adds more holistically to my gestalt of what this patient's risk is. 
then yeah, more power to you, man. You're, you're not going to like what I have to say next. We also screen for thoracic and abdominal aortas in every patient. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because we have the ultrasound out and fatty liver. Mm -hmm. We have the ultrasound out. We put it on the heart. Mm -hmm. We put it on the, I mean, we put it on the abdomen and we put it on the carotid and we go to the liver mm -hmm. and we have like a, you know, it's no harm to me and it takes less than five minutes. So, and I know that we're in the big data kind of uh, and do less uh, kind of society and, and, but there's no cost to me. And I think, it's a, I think it's a service. Most of my patients are metabolically sick. I mean, high blood pressure, high you know, diabetes. It, I think it provides me value, but I certainly can't find any data to support my practice. And, and, that's, just, and, and that's just it, right? So you know, if, if, if the people who are sitting here and listening to us and judging us and you know, saying, well, why did he say that? Yeah. Well, well listen, I, you know, there's going to be somebody who's saying, well, listen, you, you might find um, you're, you're over test. Like, I'm going to take the devil's advocate on this, and this is not a criticism. This is basically just. You can criticize me. I'm used this to it. Is, <laughs> you can see what happens on social media. Is that, you know, well, listen, you, you're, you're screening the liver, and now you find uh, a round spot. Okay. Well, what's that round? What's, what's yeah. an infinite diloma? And what's yeah. that round spot? Okay, is that round spot a hemangioma? Is it a, a is it a piece of cancer? Is it a liver cyst? And you know, now are you ordering because you don't know? Are you ordering a liver ultrasound and, and creating downstream cost? You know, or are you doing an MRI? Um, you know, yeah. or so it's all of this stuff that because of the framework that we practice in medical legally you know, uh, is there unnecessary downstream testing? Will this ultimately, you know, the spot on the liver, will this ultimately end up, you know, causing some patient to require a liver biopsy? Okay. And then, you know, they, yeah. perf the, they when they do the liver biopsy, they, you know, they perf the colon, right? And, yeah. and, then, yeah. Yeah. and then you have- I've seen it. I've seen it yeah, happen seen before. It happen. Right? So, yeah. so, 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 so do you, do you is, blame the imaging or you blame the intervention? Well, I had a, I, you know, so one of my colleagues actually wrote a paper um, of a patient that had a calcium score and basically, and they wrote this with Steve Nissen. And basically what they did is there's this person had a calcium score who was asymptomatic, who they then did a stress test, which then, uh, you know, they intervened upon and then the intervention went wrong and then that went wrong. And then the patient had a heart attack and then they were in cardiogenic shock. And then, uh, and then they ended up like ultimately getting a heart transplant. So basically the, like the, like the linear thought in the argument was calcium score equals heart transplant. Yeah. And, and like, that was, that was like worst case scenario of, uh, you know, this absolute iatrogenesis fulminans of, yep. you know, different, you know, nobody had to act, you know, you could have just as easily with that calcium score said, you got plaque, reduce your, you know, do lifestyle. Nobody forced somebody to do a stress test. Nobody forced somebody to intervene. Nobody forced somebody to do, you know, X, Y, Z. These were all downstream decisions that we could have. And started. everybody made money off of it the whole way. Right. right. That's a different, that's, you know, other competing biases. So yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, but I, I, I blame, I'm going to tell you my bias is I blame the intervener, not the, not the tester. Yeah. You know, I well, blame the intervener, not the tester. Yeah. But uh, I have one last question for you and then we're going to let you go. One last sure. cardiac imaging question. Sure. Say I have a patient who um, got a stent in an artery. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or say I have a patient who, you know, had a coronary aneurysm at a young age. Okay. And now they have disease in one artery related either to the stent or related either to this aneurysm or some other process. They have one isolated, you know, area of disease or obscurity on a calcium score. Can we still um, monitor the other arteries for disease? And can we make inferences of what's their overall health if those other arteries stay zero or, or do not progress or... Is there any value in getting a calcium score with knowing that it'll be falsely positive in one area? Yeah, probably not. And this is why, because they have known CAD, right? So if you have a stent in there, you already have an ASCVD risk score of 20%. You're already in the higher risk category. 
So well, let's uh, say coronary aneurysm then, and resulting calcium. You know, uh -huh. um, I, you know, I, you, you so know what I mean. Like, can you look at the other arteries and track <laughs> the other arteries every five or ten years? You know, listen, I guess you could. Um, it, it's just. You know, and you could tell the uh, whoever's reading it, hey, listen, disregard um, uh, this area and don't score it because I mean, it's 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 a person that scores it. So you yeah. could look at I, I I can't in my mind think of a reason why somebody would get a stent um, outside of coronary artery disease. I guess if you had like Kawasaki's or something like this and you had gigantic. You know, I mean, I'm just wondering, I, I use the stent as an example, just because it'll give you a falsely elevated school, you know, it'll give you, you have disease in that artery, right? right. Well, what about the other arteries? What about monitoring for progression? I have, you know, two patients who've had, you know, coronary aneurysms at a young age, one in pregnancy, one related to autoimmune disease, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and they asked me, should I get a calcium score? And I'm like, well, it's going to be falsely elevated, but I don't know. What about the other arteries? You know, yeah, you could, uh, you could, because I mean, all you're doing is drawing circles around the area of interest that has high calcium score. So yeah. if, if, if you did have a stent for a non coronary artery, you know, non atherosclerotic reason, which again would be very rare if somebody like that has the tachyoses or has some type of aneurysm like that. Um, I, yeah, I guess you could. It's just that this would be, you know, that's like a one out of 10,000. Yeah, I know. I'm just. I got the smart. I got the smart guy. I got the. You know, I got. I got the right person to ask the question. So. Yeah. 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 So, so you could. You, you could. We again. We we're not really using calcium scoring for surveillance. Um, okay. We're not using it to estimate progression. Uh, we may. We may end up there. I know there is some data suggesting that it's valuable to do so, um, but it, it hasn't been vetted. It hasn't been. Uh, you know, blessed by uh, the, you know, the, the meeting of the minds to say that yeah. this is this is a valuable um, uh, thing for us to do. It may be so in the future. Um, and uh, again, I like it. I, I, I don't have anything against more calcium scoring. Um, oh, that's 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 program. awesome. I'm so happy to get all your insights. I mean, this is going to be I, this is going to be great. We have so many questions about calcium scores, how to use them, lifestyle. I mean, this is going to be amazing. And one other thing I want to say is cat, look out for this, guys, because Dr. Daly is going to be uh, debating at the ACC <laughs> uh, he, in, in uh, Indiana. He's going to be representing the paleo side of the debate and Dr. Uh, Danielle uh, um, Labardo, right? What's the yeah. – yeah, she's, yeah. she's going to be – She's going to be representing the vegan side. And the good thing is here, both teams are pro-lifestyle and they're going to be debating, you know, the paleo lifestyle, the paleo keto lifestyle and the uh, plant-based lifestyle. And so that's going to be really cool. It's going to be called Rumble in the Jungle. And hopefully we'll get some people interested in cardiology and, and uh, uh, kind of watching that. So I know I'll be watching that. Looking hey, to learn. Kind to me on Twitter, guys. guys. I'm just saying. Dave. Okay. I'm, I'm just uh... – it, it's uh, you know, no, no hate mail. I, I, when you start getting into the nutrition wars, um, I, I try to stay on the sidelines for the nutrition wars because uh, people get, they, they, they so rightly believe in their own opinion. Well, right? here's the so, thing I, you know, and I say this, I, I can't agree with you. The, the team plant-based, the doctors who are very pro lifestyle mm -hmm. and um, I wish that we could all like just talk. Like I want to learn <laughs> from them. Hey, I'll, I'll tell you, I don't know if you guys saw it, but Sean Baker and Joel Kahn just had a debate that was very cordial and very, I, I was shocked because I've seen him on Twitter. I'm thinking this is an embarrassment to medicine, but that was a very, they're, they're, they were very respectful. So yeah, they both agreed on lifestyle. Let's stop fighting with each other and say, hey, look, cut out the processed garbage in the middle. And that, that's what we've been saying for a while. It's a common enemy. There's such a common it's enemy. The common it's enemy. Like, we don't have to fight. As long with each as other. you take out the, you know, animal killing is evil. If you take that out of the equation, it's like the two groups the are perfect together. It's the same. It is. It's the same message. It's like don't, don't fry things. You know, don't add sugars, don't add fats. Right. You know, it's 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 basically you know this seed you know vis a vis seed oil, you know, and uh, you know lift heavy things. I mean, it's 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 yep. just it's really funny how unbelievably simple it is. And then when it comes down to it, most of us are arguing about. Is it okay to eat deer meat, eggs, and fish? Right. So if you can, I mean, that's the whole vegetarian paleo disagreement, right? Is, is that 
you know, is, and, and that's almost an ethical or moral question rather than it's a medical question, although some people argue with me about the, the, the deer meat on that one, for sure. TMAO and all that. I like the deer meat. Doc, um, any words of wisdom on the way out? Tro, I think this is our longest podcast we've ever done, but no, I've loved every second awesome. of it. This is going to be awesome. awesome. This is no, it. I love when it. you have a world expert on cardiac imaging, I mean, we have to go into the weeds. So I can't thank you enough. This is going to be beneficial. Um, yeah, yeah. How can people, any parting words of wisdom and, and where can people interact with you? How can people see I'm you if they want a preventive cardiologist? How do they, how do they see you? Yeah, so I'm a, uh, I'm a clinical cardiologist at Franciscan Health um, Indianapolis um, uh, with Indiana Heart Physicians. Uh, I see all manner of patients. I'm the director of cardiovascular imaging um, uh, for our center, um, advanced cardiovascular imaging, cardiac CT, cardiac MRI. Um, I also practice cardio-oncology, take care of uh, cancer patients, and uh, of course, my interest is in preventative cardiology. Um, uh, so if you do need me, um, I am available. Uh, please make an appointment. Um, and if you want to interact with me on Twitter, um, I am at, at Dr. Ryan P. Daly. Uh, please be kind and respectful. And uh, <laughs> Good luck with that one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, heck, you know, it, it's funny. I used the F word yesterday and I got in trouble because I said faith and I got lit up oh, by people. Geez. Tro says the F word and no one looks at it. He's the real F word and uh, like no one cares. <laughs> it's just amazing. Just get, right? Some people can just get away with it. Man. And, uh, <laughs> it's just get away with everything, uh, man. Uh, my wife calls me the, you know, I don't do politics. But she calls me the Donald Trump of nutrition. So. <laughs> Tro was in a theological debate yesterday. I like enjoyed that. I just had that for entertainment all day. Between my hikes, I got to see Tro fighting with people. So it was fun. But Doc, thank you so much for joining us. It, it is really an Honor. Really, this is an uh, area that a lot of doctors and cardiologists and the lay public are very confused about. So hopefully this really helped enlighten people and, and um, you know, just your expertise and your lifestyle and your changes and what you're doing um, really leads, leads, gives us credibility for what we're talking about. So, Tro, do you want to close us, man? No, that's it. Uh, thank you, and uh, we'll we'll. I'll be looking forward to that debate, the rumble in the jungle. So I'll we'll, I'll be we'll, watching we'll be along, along, and this is fighting Muhammad Ali of the, of the vegetarian world. So this yeah, is, no, she this. she knows her stuff. Well, uh, it'll be fun, her. and we'll learn. I mean, I think we all learn from each other, and, and she may make points that we say, okay, we have to have an open mind and, and listen to each other, and say, oh, maybe, maybe blend is. things, right? And and for, furthermore, the, just absolutely wonderful person. So. Um, Hey, listen, guys, if you ever have any more questions, um, be happy to answer them. And, uh, you know, again, I enjoy interacting with you guys on Twitter. And uh, I keep up the good fight against uh, sugar and uh, processed foods. All right. Thanks, Doc. Words of wisdom here. Everyone, thank you for sticking with us. Thanks for listening. Uh, this is gold. This is platinum. This is amazing. So, Dr. Daly, definitely an honor to have you on. And good luck in the rumble. We're, we're rooting for you. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> <It's Italian. laughs>